the last video has shown us that the best way to strengthen the brain really is just to use the brain and to use it in lots of novel scenarios and to practice things to get better at them. What a surprise. Strengthening the brain requires effort and practice, just like strengthening the body. Nothing worth having comes easy, so they say. But this is going to seem like bad news for a lot of people, even though I basically just told you to play computer games in order to get smarter. Unfortunately, a lot of us don't want to train our brains to get smarter. We just want easy answers. This is the same reason that 90% of people never end up sticking with their training regimes. It's too hard. They want the body, the strength and the confidence, but they don't want to put in the work. Normally, I would say too bad. But as it happens, there may be a way that you can jump ahead and get the results you want more quickly. And that answer is to use smart drugs. Let's take a closer look at this concept, how it works and whether it's for you. A nootropic, also called a smart drug, is any form of medication or supplementation that can make you objectively smarter in some capacity. This might mean that you improve your memory, your focus, your creativity or something else. Either way, nootropics are to the brain what supplements and steroids are to the body. But are they safe and do they work? Well, that all depends on what kind of nootropic you intend on using. Right now, reports tell us that somewhere around 90% of executives and CEOs across America are using nootropics of various descriptions in order to get an edge on their competition. These help them stay up late, be more confident during presentations and generally perform their very best. One of the most popular forms of nootropic to this end is modafinil. Modafinil is a nootropic that works by increasing the amount of a neurotransmitter called orexin in the brain. This neurotransmitter is at least partly responsible for regulating the brain's sleep and wake cycle, along with various other bodily functions, like appetite and bowel movements. Modafinil was originally designed as a way to treat narcolepsy, a condition that causes people to fall asleep for no reason and without warning. But it was found that it could also improve various other functions, like memory, attention and reflexes. This is because it can also increase dopamine, along with various other important neurotransmitters. There are no known side effects and the pill has a half-life of 10 hours, so in theory, a CEO can pop one in the morning and then be more alert, focused and less sleepy for a whole 10-hour day. Another example is pyrocetam. Pyrocetam is a nootropic that increases acetylcholine in the brain. Acetylcholine is a generic excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, meaning it generally increases the firing rates of neurons. This results in the brain becoming more alive, and subjectively, this might make you feel more awake, more alert, and more vividly aware of your senses. Pyrocetum takes longer to take effect and needs to build up in your system over time, but a lot of people find the effects very pleasant without any notable downsides. On the other end of the spectrum, you have things like 5-HTP. 5-HTP is 5-hydroxytripotopan, which is a precursor to triphotopan, which is itself a precursor to serotonin. Precursor means building block, by the way, meaning that the brain uses these chemicals to make other chemicals. Serotonin is the feel-good neurotransmitter and is also somewhat inhibitory. This means that serotonin can help make you feel relaxed and happy at the same time and thereby combat stress. Serotonin also converts into melatonin, the sleep neurotransmitter, which makes 5-HTP a useful sleep aid when used just before bed. A CEO might use something like 5-HTP to come down after a stressful day, to perform better during a presentation by calming nerves, or just to sleep more deeply, leading to a more productive day the next day. So, now the big question. Should you use these kind of nootropics? Of course, this is up to you, but as general advice, the answer would have to be no. There are no known side effects for something like modafinil or pricetaram, 
but that's not to say there are definitely zero issues. These substances have not been tested for the long term, so no one knows what would happen were you to use them over a 10-year period. Not only that, but it's also a little concerning that we don't know precisely how many of these nootropics work. 5-HTP we understand, but it's not known precisely how modafinil impacts on orexin, only that it does. Meanwhile, it's completely uncertain how modafinil achieves its other benefits. And while there are no official side effects, I can personally tell you that that isn't entirely the case. For starters, it's well known that modafinil will make you need to go to the toilet a lot while also suppressing your appetite. This is, of course, a result of it altering the regulation of various bodily rhythms. I also found that modafinil made me bite the insides of my lips a lot as well as grind my teeth, likely a result of having lots of stimulatory neurotransmitters running around my brain. Pyrocetam will give you a headache unless you stack it with choline, and many people find that even then they can end up with both headaches and brain fog. Some people have reported feeling permanent brain fog as a result of using pyrocetam. Modafinil also makes me so focused that it isn't always a good thing. When I use it, I become glued to whatever it is I'm doing. If that's work, great. I'll be completely transfixed on work until I finish. But if I have a quick go on a computer game before I start working, then there's a good chance I'm not going to be able to stop. I'm going to complete that computer game before I get any work done. Likewise, crossing the road can be dangerous as I find myself so engaged in what I'm thinking that I can't properly pay attention to the road or to the noises or movement in my environment. I also find it harder to be creative, and this makes sense seeing as an increase in dopamine and norepinephrine is actually associated with a decrease in creativity. We're at our most creative when we are relaxed because this allows our minds to wander. The neuroscience behind this is our brain is forming new connections between disparate neurons that would normally never be associated, which is how our invention happens. But when you're highly focused, you become too fixated on one thing, and this time is creativity. The point of all this? Well, the brain operates the way it does for a purpose. Optimum brain function is not being able to focus on one thing for a long time. Optimum brain function is about being able to switch from one brain state to another as necessary. You need to be highly focused when you're working and then relaxed when you're not. You need to let your mind wander when you're trying to come up with new ideas and then focus up when you're asked a difficult question. When you artificially increase too much of a certain neurotransmitter, you make it very hard to do this and you get stuck in one state. It feels optimum, but in fact it's just an artificial high. Another problem with these types of neurotransmitters is that they can actually be addictive because of something called tolerance and dependence. What happens here is that the brain adapts to that increased or decreased neurochemical. For example, if you have artificially increased the amount of dopamine in your brain on a regular occurrence, then your brain might respond by removing dopamine receptors to make the brain less responsive to it. Alternatively, it might reduce the amount of dopamine you naturally produce. In short, you now need a bigger dose of the same substance in order to get the same feeling as before and eventually your baseline can become so low that you feel bad until you get it. While modafinil and pyrocetam aren't officially supposed to be addictive, 5-HTP actually can be and is better avoided for this reason. That, and essentially making your brain sleepy, is not the solution to heighten social skills and confidence. Well, no surprise there, really. As though that wasn't enough reason, it's also important to recognise that neurotransmitters do not exist in a vacuum. That is to say that any one neurotransmitter you alter will automatically impact on many others and might have other effects on the body. We've already seen, for instance, that serotonin converts to melatonin and that orexin affects our hunger and bowel movements. Then there's the fact that serotonin links to appetite and that cortisol, also linked with dopamine, affects our testosterone levels. 
There are undoubtedly countless neurotransmitters that we have yet to even discover. And what this means is that when you take a nootropic that affects one neurotransmitter, you really make all kinds of untold changes in your brain without really knowing what the consequences of that action might be. For this reason, it's highly advisable to focus on other ways to get your mental upgrade. But there is a nootropic that most of us already use on a regular basis. That nootropic is, of course, caffeine, which is the secret ingredient in tea and coffee that makes us wake up in the morning and feel more alert. This is just like any other nootropic, the only difference being that it's been around longer and is therefore a little more commonplace. So, how does caffeine work? Basically, caffeine is able to mimic a neurotransmitter in the brain called adenosine. Adenosine is a byproduct of the energy process in the brain. When your mitochondria utilize glucose for energy, they do this by converting it first to ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, and then breaking that ATP apart into its constituent parts, including adenosine. Adenosine builds up throughout the day as we use our brain cells for thinking, moving, and powering our bodies. But this substance is inhibitory and over time it makes us tireder and sleepier. Eventually we become so sluggish that we're forced to go to bed and a good night's sleep is then able to flush our brain out of the excess adenosine ready for morning. What caffeine does is to block the adenosine receptors. Because caffeine is a similar shape to adenosine, it can plug the holes where adenosine is supposed to go and that then prevents adenosine from working its magic. This makes us feel more awake and alert and causes a spike in brain activity. This spike in brain activity then results in a flood of other excitatory neurotransmitters being released, which includes dopamine, norepinephrine and more. So, is it safe to use? Will caffeine give you a healthy kick? Well, yes and no. On the one hand, caffeine has actually been shown in studies to reduce your chances of developing Alzheimer's, and in that sense, it is neuroprotective. It does enhance wakefulness and memory, and it's relatively very safe. At the same time, though, caffeine is also essentially stress in a cup. It works by increasing many of our stress hormones, and this can decrease creativity, as we've seen, while also causing numerous other problems. More worryingly, caffeine is addictive owing to the mechanisms we described earlier. If you become dependent on caffeine, you'll find you can get raging headaches whenever you go long periods without it. What's more, it's actually been suggested that what many of us think of as morning grogginess is actually just a withdrawal symptom from caffeine. In other words, we wake up and feel sluggish because we've gone for so long without caffeine. It's really up to you if you take it or not, but this is an excellent demonstration of the risks associated with nootropics versus the benefits. My advice is to think of all nootropics like laser tools. Stay away from them 90% of the time, but when you absolutely need to get a huge amount of work done, consider using them just for that day.